th thanks to everyone who's hopped in here um, and who's who's uh, watching the recording after the fact. Um, we're gonna let's go ahead and get started now, um, and I'll keep letting people in as as they uh, hop in a few minutes late here. Um, but I'm really excited to have Willie Wood here on our Chowski Endurance Masterclass. Um, we're uh, Willie is just a, a wealth of information about all things high school and college running. Um, so I want to kind of embarrass Willie and have you introduce yourself. Um, you were a coach at Columbia um, and now you run fast track recruiting, which I would say is like the premier um, recruiting program in the country for high schoolers that are looking to get recruited to run in college. Um, but other than that, I'd love to have you just kind of give a little bit of your backstory um, in terms of both like your background as a college coach and kind of how you got into the recruiting side of things and then how you eventually made the switch from full-time coaching to just focusing on helping kids with recruitment. Sure, sure. So like, yeah, as you mentioned, you know, I've been coaching or I coached college for 28 years. Um, the vast majority of that time was spent at Columbia University. I was the head coach there for 20 years. So that was certainly, you know, that's when I look back, I think of my coaching career, I certainly think of Columbia. Um, but the, probably the one unique thing in my career, and I, I had a lot of jobs prior to Columbia as I was working my way up the coaching ladder, as probably almost everybody does who's in college coaching. But the one probably overriding theme of my career path, the way it went, like I was fortunate my first two jobs were at the University of Kansas and University of Georgia. Um, so, like, you know, big time programs, very successful, a lot of resources. The recruiting was pretty simple. But I decided pretty early on, I left Georgia probably at age 24, 25, I just decided I wanted to be a head coach. That was the most important thing to me. So I wanted to take that route. So I took a, a job at a really small school, Kansas Wesleyan University in Salina. Um, I think they had literally like four or 500 kids there. No, no running program. And I think the, like the, the primary reason for, for them even wanting to start a running program was probably to generate revenue through tuition dollars of track kids or something like that. But anyways, you know, so I started a program there. Then I was hired at Bethel College in Minnesota, started a program there. Then I was hired at um, the University of North Carolina, Asheville, who had, they, had, they were division one school, but a pretty low level division one. And I kind of started their program. And, and then I went to Columbia. And when I got to Columbia, they had been last place in the Ivy League for like 25 or 30 straight years, probably had like 10 kids on the team or something. So I basically started a program there. And the reason I'm saying that was is because everywhere I've ever been, I relied fully on recruiting. Like, and I was never going to get the best recruits. The school I was at, we weren't going to attract the top kids because we had no tradition of success. Um, we had no reputation. Everything we were selling was kind of a pipe dream of what we thought we could become. So it became very like important to me to, to, see be, to see beyond just numbers or marks in a particular event, but to find people that fit within a particular culture or find people who mesh with you from a personality perspective. And I think it gave me a unique insight on a lot of other coaches where if I hadn't experienced those schools, if I would have just stayed at Kansas or Georgia, I don't think I would have fully grasped how important it is to make personal connections with people and how important it is to be connected to people in terms of if you're going to get significantly better after you make that decision, you know? So um, I, I think my recruiting background from a college perspective is certainly immense. I would imagine, you know, there's probably like over, I would guess probably in my 28 years, over a thousand kids who've matriculated to the school where I was working at. I would bet I did, I don't know, like probably in excess of 2000 official visits, probably in excess of 20 or 25,000 recruiting calls. So I've certainly seen my share of all aspects of it, you know, because obviously everybody's an individual, everybody's different, everybody's looking for something different. So it really gave me a pretty widespread background in terms of how to, how to most effectively help people and, and how to help people navigate the system. The, the one thing, getting to your last question, the one thing that really stuck out to me or stood out to me always was everything was very one-sided. Um, I had all the information on my side, but most of the families were going through this process for the very first time, and they didn't have a lot of information on their side. As a result, they were dependent upon, you know, maybe a random uncle who ran in the 50s or a friend who got recruited to play a different sport somewhere else or something like that. But they didn't really have pertinent, like, live time information in terms of how to na navigate the, the system most effectively. And, it, and I feel like it boiled down to a couple of things, you know, or probably three things. You could have your high school coach 
call, which may or may not be effective. If they don't know the college coach, probably not effective. You know, you could rely on the fact that people say, if you run fast, people are going to find you, but a lot of people run fast and not everybody finds you. Um, you know, so, um, or, um, or, you know, I mean, or you could just have like, you know, like a family member help you or whatever it might be. So, or, you know, like the, the only recruiting services out there, I guess, were these web-based profile platforms where you would put your profile on a website and hope somebody came to find you. And typically the better schools weren't looking there because they didn't have to look there, you know? So I thought it was a real need in terms of not just getting somebody recruited, you know, because I think anybody could get recruited to a school. If you send enough letters or emails, you're going to get recruited. But like, you know, my vision and I, I think what we're doing, it's, it's much more beyond just getting recruited. It's like, how do you find the best fit? How do you end on the highest rung on the ladder? How do you find a place where you're really honestly going to thrive? And, and that's what we focus on, you know, much more of the cultural aspect of things. Yeah, no, it's such a complicated process. And, and I'd love to walk through it. So I think a cool way to do that, let's, let's just pretend we're talking, I'm a high school student. So what is the first thing I should be doing as a high school student? And when does that happen? Is it, you know, am I waiting until junior, senior year? Or is this something that kids should start thinking about as early as, you know, beginning high school? Right. I mean, I would suggest starting early. I think starting early is better than not starting early. Um, you know, if, if to put it in like your situation, you know, if you were to run a 50 mountain or a 50 mile mountain race, at some point, I'm sure you would rather have, you know, 12 months to prepare for it as opposed to three months to prepare for it. It doesn't mean you couldn't adequately, adequately prepare for it in a given amount of time that you had, you know? So, I mean, if you're a senior who watches this video, like I wouldn't want it to be like an alarm ending, like, well, you just blew it. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> yeah. Now you just have to make the best of your situation, you know? But I found with the families I work with, that when we start early, when they're freshmen or sophomores, the process is much more logical, patient, deliberate. It's just a calm grasping of, all right, what is, what is it I'm looking for in a school, whether it be ge geographical location, academic selectivity, it's a power five school or not. Um, but it, it gives you, like, I, I think the having the ability to have tangible benchmarks along the way is very helpful, you know. So mm -hmm. to say I want, I say a vague concept, I would love to run for Stanford track. That would be awesome. That's my dream come true. I'm a boy two miler. You know, as a junior and you're calling me, there's not a lot I can do to help you if your PR is 925, right? Stanford, you're not going to run for Stanford if you have a 925 two mile PR. Because that's but if too we slow, have this conversation, right? just, to, just to be clear. What's that? Because that's too slow, just to be clear. Oh, right, right. And which is an amazing time, right? But not for right, Stanford. Right, exactly. Right. Yeah. Stanford is like one of the top programs in the country. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So maybe you have to run sub nine. You probably do, or, you know, awfully close yeah. to sub nine. But as where if we had that conversation as a freshman, you know, and maybe you're a 945 guy, then we could logically track, all right, let's put in a process in place that would help you move closer to that. And who knows, maybe you run that time or not. Not many people do, but at least you have a plan. There's a plan of action and you've acted proactively um, with enough time to change things, you know, and, and it can influence everything. It's for influencing, not jacking around your freshman year and getting four C's and eliminating Stanford, no matter how fast you run or something like that, you know? Yep. So I think it's like, I think the early you can start is better, best, mm -hmm. and then just creating goals of where you would like to be. And then more importantly, like implementing a process to get there, ideally giving yourself the, the most amount, amount of time to get there. You know, I, I think the recruiting process, it's, it's twofold. It's, it's you identifying and exploring opportunities for yourself, but then it's coaches identifying kids who are going to be good fits for their programs, you know? And yeah. I think you need to kind of work both of those simultaneously. And the longer you have, obviously, the better off you are. Um, yeah. With that yeah. said, you know, there's track, there's a lot of kids who run track in college. You know, there's a ton of people who run, are running in high school. So there's certainly opportunities out there. So if you're starting later, you know, if you're not getting started to your junior year or prior to your senior year, you know, you just have to get on it a lot more quickly. You just maybe like, you know, the equivalent of training as a distance runner, maybe you just have to take some risk and bump your mileage up a little bit quicker than you would have normally wanted to or something like that. But I've worked with a couple of kids um, who we didn't start working together until the conclusion of their senior year. And two of them ended up at ACC schools with scholarships. 
Um, so wow. it's never ultimately too late, you know, it, it's just way more stressful on everybody. That's for certain. Got it. So it's, it's almost like counterintuitively, the earlier you start, the less stressful it's going to be because you have more time to kind of space things out and plan, right? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I take, I say that assuming you're a healthy, normal, calm individual, if it creates an neuroses <laughs> and you're stressed at your freshman track meet, if you didn't run fast enough to go to Stanford, then obviously you probably should have waited to your senior year and, and enjoyed yep. high school a lot more or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. Totally. So you kind of touched on this a little bit before, but I think a question a lot of people have, like I had this question as a, like someone who really just got into running late in, in high school was like, how, like, what is the minimum standard to really consider running in college other than like at the club level? So essentially in the NCAA, whether it's D1, D2, D3, um, uh, NAIA, you know, like how, how slow is too slow? How fast do I have to be to consider running on a college team? Right. I mean, there's such a variance in that. Um, you know, again, if you take, take a, say if you're a miler and you're looking a boy or a, a female miler looking at Oregon and Stanford, nowadays, the way everyone's running so fast, you know, you, you probably have to be 435, say in the 1600 or something like that. Just a random number, four, 440, who knows, but you have to be awfully fast. If you were a, a woman miler wanting to go to you know, a smaller NAIA school in Kansas, like in the conference I was in, you know, like at a Kansas Wesleyan, you were probably getting scholarship money at 535 or something like that, you know? So track, there's so many opportunities out there um, for either, particularly, you know, I would say on the female side, particularly for scholarship money, but on a particip participation side, there's so many opportunities out there for men and women. There's really not a cutoff. You know, I think, I think it's really important to have a really good support network in place, people who can really guide you in the right way. Um, and I think it's important to be realistic in terms of, all right, how are my times lining up with the schools I'm saying I want to go to? You know, I, I spoke with somebody the other day on a, just on a recruiting assessment call and th their son really wanted to go to a very high end division one school. Um, and they were the third best runner on their team right now. And they got 12th in their county meet and cross country, which is commendable. That's an awesome day, right? But you're not going to go to a school like Notre Dame or Stanford or UNC or UVA right now if you're 12th in your county. So, you know, it just suggested to me, and, you know, and, and the justification was, well, it's a really hard county. And it's just like, yeah, but the ACC is a really hard conference as well, you know? So, but, and it was of no fault of theirs. They just didn't have a network in place to know in which direction should we be moving? Like what's logical for us and what's not? You know, it's, it's very easy to make a vague, set a vague goal of, I would love to run NCAA division one, or I want to run out of power five, but nobody, nobody really understands what that truly means. And even like, as you're aware, even within division one schools, power five schools, there's still a massive variance depending on what event group you're in at each school, you know, it's not like, say like basketball or football where it's all pretty comparable, you know, maybe there's a, a slight difference in talent, but it's relatively comparable. Um, you know, some schools in division one, a power five school, they don't put any money into distance running. And, you know, you could be a 430, 1600 meter boy and be able to go there. And then other schools, you'd have to run 410 to walk on there. So it, it's, it's a really difficult process to navigate without just doing research. There's no real generic answer. There's no real like, all right, if you run this, you're going to go to this particular school. Because even if you could set an accurate recruiting standard saying, all right, Notre Dame's probably looking for somebody who can run sub 910, it's still going to be dependent upon how many spots they have remain available that next year, how many kids they took the prior year, who you're up against in that particular recruiting class. But with all that said, the good thing is, is there's a lot of information out there if you do your research. You know, there's websites where you can go to and see a particular team, all of their PRs. You can see all the rankings like in cross country and how they do in their region and stuff like that. So, you know, I, I, I think you really need to without limiting yourself, like understand where you fit, understand what are reach schools, have people in, in your support network who can help guide you and point you in the right direction. And then it's pretty easy. You know, it's not like, it's not like football or basketball where you, you don't really know what 8.4 yards of carry means because you don't know the competition. 
and track everybody knows if you run 10 three in the 100 meters you're really fast you know and and you know how you stack up to everybody so even though there is a lot of variance and it can cause some confusion it's it's also extremely simple to research in terms of will i be a, a good fit at this school or not got it so then once i've maybe got a list of schools how active is the recruiting process for me the high school student like you said at the very beginning you know there are these sites where i can put my profile and hope the coach finds me do you recommend that students are doing active outreach on their part or are coaches actively looking for me the student i would do active i would be very proactive you know everybody i work with we identify the schools that are going to be good fits based on everything the academic perspective the culture the community the town the area of the country everything and then contact those coaches directly i would think probably the most logical sequencing of events would be you would fill out their online recruiting questionnaire that's very easy to find you just go to this the track specific website there'll be typically a little box that says recruiting or more on it you click on it and fill in your information then i would follow up with an email you know summarizing very briefly why you're interested in that school what your prs are what your academic background is testing and gpa if you have it you know and and thanking them for your time you don't really have to list out a long lineage of every place you got at every meet or if you were fourth in the in your conference meet you know everyone's just kind of looking for your pr and your gpa and test scores for the most part um but it's very important to reach out to them like even though the information is out there and it's really readily accessible it's pretty far-fetched to think say if you're a boy 400 meter or a girl 400 meter runner in texas you know and, and you're probably really good but you might not advance as far as you would if you were in another state that's not as quite as competitive so you know and and you want to go to the northeast there's a good chance that schools in new york new jersey connecticut rhode island vermont didn't see your results because you didn't advance past the dis district meet because it took 55 five to get out of your district or something like that you know so schools aren't it, it's it's more difficult for schools to find kids than they than it was and there's been a huge shift in that process. When I was coaching, even still five years, six years ago, we were reaching out still. You know, when I first started, we would only reach out. Then still, as I was leaving, the majority of the communication was on us. But now it's just so easy for high school student athletes to reach out to college coaches that I think coaches use that as somewhat, you know, to vet a level of interest you know like well if this kid was interested why wouldn't they email me it's so easy to do and tell me that they're interested um so i certainly wouldn't wait and unfortunately a lot of high school student athletes get that get that information from people saying if you run fast they're going to find you and those tend to be the the, the families i work with later in the process because they believe that and then they're calling me saying you know my son or daughter is running fast but nobody's finding them actually what do we do kind of a thing and then it's just a simple fix you, you send emails out and all of a sudden people are finding you and they know about you um right. you know but but i think it's very important to to reach out to coaches and it's very important i mean like to have somebody like your english teacher or somebody have somebody read over your email like you know avoid using slang do not call <laughs> the coach by his first name do not say you're interested in the wrong school, which happens a lot. Oh, um, no. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, I would get so many emails when I was at That's Columbia. So bad. <laughs> repeat it probably five times a year. I'd be like, hey, coach, I just wanted to reach out to you. I would absolutely love to run for Princeton or Harvard. I'd be like, oh, really? That's awesome. I'm like, I don't <laughs> know why you're telling me that. But yeah, exactly. Yeah. So really <laughs> proofread it because it's easy to make mistakes. And don't use any like tech slang or like look it over carefully for sure because this is like, you're applying to college, you know, it's like a kind of a big deal. Like, so, and they, and they're going to want to know that you can survive there academically and not be so overwhelmed by the process that you're exhausted all the time. So definitely have somebody look it over who you trust. So that leads really well into the next question I have, which is, so let's go back to you as a coach at Columbia. If you have someone who really wants to come to Columbia, who's super fast, but doesn't have maybe the test scores or the GPA that a normal Columbia student, like a non-athlete would need to get in. How much sway does a college coach actually have to kind of nudge that student up the list a little bit? Right. Um, I would just say like, whatever the, the largest descriptor for massive is like, it's so immense. Like, I mean, you can really? help so much. Yes. Huh. So when I was at Columbia, 
I'm sure it's not the same. So I'm sure I'm not betraying any Columbia secrets. But when I was at Columbia, I was allowed to recruit 16 men and 16 women each year. That's how many kids we could get into the class. Mm -hmm. You know, the typical student would probably have to be in the vicinity of, I don't know, over 1500. That's for sure. Saying an SAT, you know, wow. like if you want to get in on your own merit, maybe higher than that now. But for us, and these aren't actual numbers, like I'm just guessing off the top of my head what it was. But for us at this point, five or six years ago, maybe for those 32 kids, we had to average, say, 1350 or something like that. So that means we could go all the way down to whatever it would be, a 1200, if we could find a 1500 to balance them out kind of a thing. And, you know, I would say the Ivies can help a lot. I mean, you still have to be a phenomenal student, no doubt about it. But you don't have to be the best student in the entire state to have a prayer to get in or something like that, you know, um, right. there's a lot of leeway that way. I would say the power five schools even have much more leeway where if, if you're an athlete that they want, the school's going to take you um, for the most part within reason, obviously. Um, and when I say this, I don't say this in a way to encourage somebody being slack. I'm, I'm saying it with the assumption that if you're applying to one of these schools, the assumption is, is that you've been responsible you've prepared well, you know, you've done the best you can in school. You know, like we certainly couldn't have got a kid admitted with C's on his transcript or something like that, you know? So you do have to be very responsible in terms of your academic pursuits, but it does allow you the ability to get a little bit higher than you would have without that, that's for certain. And, you know, and there, there's a lot of variance in that. Some of the highly, highly selected division three schools don't have that same type of flexibility. You know, say like, uh, the really math driven schools, like a school like MIT, they're going to have a base level math school that you have to have. And they're not going to deviate from that because you probably wouldn't be successful there academically if, if they went below that particular number, you know, but it's, it's really the whole basis of my company model. The families I work with, for the most part, I would say 95% of them are really looking to utilize athletics as a mechanism to enhance admissibility. And I don't mean that in a way to use it. Like track is very important to them. You know, like when I was at Columbia, we had some of the very best kids in the country. Like my last year's there, like Waverly, Waverly near around like 1534, like Kyle Merber and Johnny Gregoric. These kids were as good as anybody in the country. So, you know, when I say you, like I, I emphasize utilize, not use. Like, you know, it's, it's somebody who's very, very gifted athletically, but they also are equally gifted academically. And it's, and, and it's a really good mechanism. And I don't mean to just focus on the Ivy League because it's equally so the entire way down. Any school can help any athlete for the most part. And it's a different process. You know, typically, I don't know of any schools, and, and I, I'm sure I'm wrong on this, but I'm, I'm sure it's not 100% whole like truth whatever but I don't know of any schools where an athlete goes to the general admissions pool and that's how they're evaluated a coach always sends a list over you know you might go to the general like um student pool pool if if you're not on a coach's list but if a coach has to do they want they usually have Sorry, guys, just a little technical error there. Lost, uh, Willie, are you still there? We yeah, yeah, your, yeah. Sorry, I accidentally lost your audio there for a second. I'm sorry. Um, anyway, uh, um, so let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about kind of the balance. We started talking about this with kind of Ivy League stuff. So in terms of academic and athletic, and, you know, you mentioned cultural as well and, like, location, like, how do you recommend that a student balance these different priorities? Should, should I be choosing a school based on athletic opportunities or academic opportunities or is there no easy way to answer that this is like a little bit of both right i mean i think it, it's a very individual question depending upon what your priorities are you know maybe if i was a, a high school girl high jumper and i had jumped six four and i knew i had a professional career or like cindy cindy mclaughlin mclaughlin like when she went to kentucky for one year or two years one or two years whatever it was you know I, and i'm not saying kentucky's a good school or not not even part of the equation of what I'm talking about. But if you know you're going to be a, a high-end runner, then it makes a lot of sense to go to like a high-end school, right? Where they're going to develop you the most and you're going to take that next step as a pro. If, if you know you wanna be a doctor or an engineer, then Harvard and Princeton or any other school with great pre-med programs become very viable options. Um, I, I feel like there's enough, there's enough 
opportunity out there that you can combine both. I don't think one negates the other. I don't think you have to say, well, academics are important to me, so I, I'm not going to go to an athletic school because if you care about academics, you could go to UNC, UVA, Notre Dame, or Rice, you know, and they all have really good athletic programs. And, um, you know, and I think conversely, like you, if you look at a school like on the far end of the spectrum, like an MIT, a very strong academic school. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you might think that's an academic choice, but they're phenomenal. They have amazing runners on their team. I know, like for me, when I was at Columbia, it was always a pet peeve when I would talk to a high school kid and they would like, you know, I'm looking at these three schools and they were all power five schools. And this, and this would be a distance runner for, for athletics, but we're looking at for you guys for academics. And I, I mean, yeah, for academics. And I'd always remind them, it's like, yeah, but you get, we beat them in athletics too, right? Like we are actually better. So sometimes I think in track and field, it's easy to, to group. Like when you think of athletics, the athletic choice, that's really like, who's the best football team or basketball team or in track, that's not always the case, right? Because if NAU had football, they're never beating Alabama in football. That's for sure. Um, you know, so there's so many different varying degrees in track in terms of like the level of quality of school that I, I don't think you would ever have to make that decision. You know, I, I just don't think that would come up. I think that's your personal preference because say if you didn't want to run division one and you wanted to go to a really good school athletically, I mean, you have schools like Williams, Johns Hopkins, those programs are as good as half the division one schools easily, probably more than that, you know? So sure. I, I think it's really identifying the characteristics that are most important to you, where you feel most at home and, and moving in that direction. Got it. So now let's say I've done the application process. I've gotten into a few schools. Um, how do you help students decide on what school they end up at? So I know, you know, you can go on official visits, you have unofficial visits, um, you know, there's different scholarship offers. How do you, what are the things that you tell students to, to look for on a team if they're actually going there in person? Right, right. So I think for me personally, I, I don't know if I view it differently or not, but you know, I think again, and it goes back to what we just discussed, it's identifying what's most important to you as a person. Um, you know, what elements of college are going to matter to me most, you know, as academic support, sports medicine support, indoor track facilities, trails close to campus, a diverse campus, scholarship, do, are they offering me preferred walk-on status? Am I going to be the 33rd best guy on the team and never get to go to a meet because I'm never going to work my way up? Or, you know, am I going to be the third or fourth best kid and get a lot of personal attention from a coach because I'm the future of that program or something? I just think there's so many variables that are involved and I don't think any of them are right or wrong. It's just, are they right or wrong for you? I worked with, I worked with a boy last year. Um, we had worked together for like two or three years and I coached him for like two or three years. We worked together in the recruiting piece and he ended up being like the national athlete of the week on mile split and cross country twice that fall. Like, I mean, he's phenomenal. He ended up, you know, ran like sub nine, sub four ten. He could have gone anywhere. And he ended up going to Williams College and it was truly the best fit for him. He liked everything about it. That was home to him. And he went to Williams. And then this year as a freshman indoors, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if somebody passed him the last week or not, but indoors, he had run the fastest time as any true freshman in the nation, division one or division three. Um, wow. you know, he ran like 14 flat indoors. And then he ended up getting second outdoors this year in the 5K. Um, so it truly was. He chose what was the best fit for him. And because it checked all the boxes, because it felt like home to him, he flourished in that environment, you know? So I think it really does matter. I think it's seeing beyond the prestige of a name or seeing beyond what your friends think is cool or seeing beyond where your parents want to tell your aunt and uncle you're going. It's like where, this is like where you're going to be every day for the next four or five years. These people are going to be your, literally your best friends for the rest of your life. Um, and this is going to be one of the best four or five years of your entire life, you know? So, and it's just like, find the variables that matter the most and really focus in on them as opposed to getting overwhelmed by a particular name or it, whatever it might be, you know? So. Yeah. My, my high school coach, I remember told me you should like the running is important, but you should also pick a school that like, if you got injured on the first day of class and never ran a step that you would still be happy there. You can't right. just take it for the team and the, and the running. Right. And I mean, you know, and a lot of kids will make, and as a coach, like, you know, I would always be flattered when a kid chose a school because of me, or if they articulated saying, you know, I wanted to be there because of you, but just look, you know, like in the last 
week alone on the track and field circuit, you know, like the Notre Dame coach is now at Tennessee, the Ole Miss coach is now at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So you, you just never know, you know, like along the lines of what you said, we had, we used to have when I was at Columbia, like a senior send off where the seniors would have an opportunity to speak and say, you know, what their experience was like or something like that. And we had a young man say, he's like, you know, Columbia was the best choice for me I could have ever made in my entire life. He's like, but I made it for every wrong reason. Every reason I made it for didn't really impact me like I thought it would. It was a billion other things, you know? So there is, there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. Like, who knows, maybe you don't develop like you thought you were going to, or who knows, maybe you get an amazing internship somewhere and it's a better life decision for you two years down the road or something like that. You know, there's a lot of other yeah. aspects of college life that are going to influence how happy you are while you're there. So. No, I agree with you. Yeah. Really. Absolutely. Um, okay. To wrap up, I think this has been super uh, just informational for me. I, I hope that whoever's watching this, that you guys got a lot out of as well. And, and we will open this to questions at the end. If there's anyone in here, feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself if you have questions. Um, but the last question I want to ask, you know, we've obviously talked a lot about running um, and academics, but for you as a coach, when you were recruiting, is there anything you would tell a high schooler, maybe even like a freshman, um, things that they could be doing to help their resume other than those things, other than running faster, other than, um, you know, having a good GPA? Do you look for things like, oh, this kid's well-rounded, he's, you know, in the jazz band and, or he does, you know, theater or things like that? Right. Um, I, I, I don't mean this in a way, like I would never, like I think people should be involved in their community for whatever reason. Like, I, you know, like just it's the good thing to do, be a good human being for sure. Um, without a doubt. But going back to what we said earlier, like it's, it's very important to have a system in place. Like being a good person, being heavily involved will help you in some capacity without a doubt. You know, it'll have an influence on somebody. But if you're a, a, if you're a 442 miler who was the lead singer in every play in the history of your school, donated shoes to everybody in your city and have pledged to do so for the rest of your life, and it was up between you and some selfish kid who nobody likes but ran 411. Odds are the kid who ran 411 is getting in over the kid who ran 442, you know. So I would say do really well in school, run as fast as you possibly can, and be a good human being. And you're probably enhances, enhancing your chances a lot. But I think anybody wants to know that you have a resume that's reflective of teamwork, of leadership, of understanding what community means, of a sacrifice and giving of self for some collective movement. You know, I think all of those things are very, very important for a billion reasons, even beyond recruiting, yeah. you know, just for humanity's sake. Yeah. Yeah. Just like developing as a like well-rounded adult for sure. Exactly. Right. Right. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah. Any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or, or put them in the chat. Um, otherwise, um, Willie, is there anything else you kind of want to leave us with? Like, parting words, any kind of last insights, maybe? No, I just think, just enjoy the process. It's awesome. Like so many people look, view it as stressful um, or overwhelming. And all you're doing is deciding really cool things for your life. Like where are you going to mm -hmm. go to college? Where am I going to run track at? What am I going to study yeah. in college? Like it's just a massively enjoyable process and don't get overwhelmed by it. There is no wrong choice. Just go look at any school in the country randomly and Google their famous alums and People do amazingly well no matter where they end up or look at the U.S. Olympic team or, you know, over the years and there'll be guys from Division three on there, guys from schools you never heard of there. So don't get so caught up or get stressed by the thing. Just enjoy the whole process. Absolutely. I love that. And the last thing I want to say that we, we did not touch on, but I think is actually a really important point is you do not have to stay at the same school that I actually transferred schools. I went to a school freshman year that had no NCAA running program. It was a small liberal arts school. And I decided I really wanted to run NCAA and I transferred. And like you just said, I actually think my life would have been great in either decision. If I had stayed at that school and just like been on the club running team and run road races, or if I had transferred like I did and ran uh, division three, which I ended up doing, like they, those were both great options. Um, and so if you get to a school and you decide either way, like maybe you get to a school and you just don't like the team, you, maybe you get a new coach or something, um, like that's, that's not something that you're married to as a freshman, you can transfer, you can go to a different division, to a different school. Um, the, you know, there are totally options there. 
I actually um, transferred twice as an undergrad. I went to three really? different schools over five years. Yeah. Oh so my gosh. I'm fully on board with you. Like, and I, I loved all three of them actually. I had a blast. There you go. Um, we got one question in here. Um, how often should we reach out to college coaches, especially if we don't get a response after the initial email? Great question. So, like, yeah. Good question. I mean, you want to be persistent, not annoying. That's for certain. Um, I, but I, I, I just started working with a young boy, like probably in the last month, and he had a school really high on his list, and they hadn't gotten back to him at all, you know, and I said, send a follow up. So he sent a follow up, he still didn't get back to them. So then I reached out to the coach and said, Oh, by the way, this kid's really interested in your school. And he's like, Oh, yeah, I just saw that I'm just cleaning out my my inbox. Now, I got swamped by the end of the season, and I was going to get back to him, you know, so realize that coaches like, they're coaching year round, they're traveling all the time. Most of them have families. They probably have kids and they're swamped and they're really, really busy. And it's not like football where you have 15 coaches recruiting. You know, you just have two or three people doing it, but you still need football like numbers. So be persistent. I wouldn't do it every week or anything like that. But, you know, every second or third week saying, hey, coach, I just wanted to re reiterate how interested, in, I, how interested I am in your program by way of reminder, and you can cut and paste part of your first, first email and say, please let me know if you need anything or something like that, but stay persistent for sure. Yeah, great question, thank you. Anyone else have questions in the chat? Anything else? Awesome. Well, Willie, this has been really great. I totally appreciate your time and all of your knowledge that you've, uh, you know, put together over these last few decades. It's just incredible to hear you talk about this stuff. Like you just have so much in here, like every single, whether it's high jump or, you know, 400 or two mile, like you've got so much information in there. So thank no, you. It's guys awesome. You don't really normally get to talk to a community that understands that. <laughs> so it's just a wealth of like stored away knowledge. So like, yeah, it's cool to get no, it out once in a while. Yeah. It's uh, you've developed a, a truly unique skill set and knowledge set here that is, uh, you know, for young people, you know, if I'd had this information, I think my whole college process definitely would have been a lot less stressful. So um, it's, it's fantastic what you're doing and um, we'll definitely keep in touch and, and continue learning more about this whole process from you. Um, so thank you so much for your time and thank you guys all who have been here listening and for your great questions. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. All right. Have a great night, everybody. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.